The 24th annual McMinimins UFO Fest is descending on McMinnville May 17th and 18th. There will be live music, parades, costume balls, and contests. You can also hear expert speakers and first-person accounts of UFO encounters, including from former Navy pilot Ryan Graves, who last year came out very publicly about our military's regular UFO sightings. Do you remember that? That was super weird. Other guest speakers include Garrett M. Graff, author of really long titled books like The U.S. Government's 80-Year Quest to Understand the Mystery of UFOs, and Roderick Martin, host of the podcast High Strangeness. Tickets are available for believers and skeptics alike at ufofest.com. So you've hiked in Oregon's forests, skied its mountains, searched for its waterfalls, and swam, but most probably just looked at its ocean because it's really cold. Now what? Well, some Oregonians say the real adventure awaits in our region's deserts. Out there, you'll see landscapes unlike anywhere else in the Northwest. Remnants of volcanic activity, aromatic brush and desert wildflowers, black-tailed jackrabbits and a big old crack in the ground. And spring is the absolute perfect time to visit. So today on CityCast, Portland Norther Emily of Wild Solitude Guiding is here to help us plan the perfect high desert adventure. It's Monday, April 29th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. You know, you say Oregon's high desert is your favorite part of the state. Why? <laughs> like, what if, there's just so many different parts of the state. Why the high desert? I love the high desert because it has better weather than we do here in the Valley. And then also um, summer extends much further into fall. So uh, the shoulder seasons are kind of like the best time to go to the desert. And you know how it is, like after you've done the four months straight of rain, um, all I wanna do is bask in the sun. Like all I wanna do in life is just be warm and have the sun on me. So like a little lizard. Yeah, like a little lizard. So that's what I look forward to. Like every, starting in March every year is like, desert season. Nice. There's also a significant amount of public land over there. Um, I know I say this all the time, but the state of Oregon is like 51% public land. And, and the majority of that is in the East. And so you can find like a lot of solitude. You can find an infinite number of places to camp for free that are super scenic and beautiful. And then when you come home and tell your friends, none of them are going to have any reference point for what you just did or any of the places you went to. So you're like, I could I could sound like a really cool teenager who just like knows about You get to be really cool. Yeah, of like, yeah, oh you you don't know about this band. <laughs> oh, you don't yeah. know about the high desert. All right. I wanna set this <laughs> I wanna set the record straight. Are we talking about central Oregon or eastern Oregon? Or does that distinction really matter? I am so curious what other people think of because I feel like Eastern Oregon is both the eastern third of the state and also everything east of the Cascades. Okay, okay. Because that's kind of the, the, that's the defining line, right? Is like you're either on the west side or you're in the rain shadow. I don't see much of a reason to make a distinction between those landscapes unless we're just talking about like, like distance wise and location. Okay, cool. I wanted to share something real quick with you. Um, like when I moved to this area, I would keep hearing the high desert, the high desert. And both John and I thought very different things when we heard that term, because also he's not from Oregon. So when he heard about the high desert, he actually thought it was like an honorific title, like the grand desert, the high (laughs) desert. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought it was a really cheeky way of someone saying like, we're going to get high at the desert. (laughs) I didn't know that it was like an elevation thing. You know, like, I didn't know, like, no, no, it's called the high desert because it's tall. (laughs) You know, (laughs) because I just didn't get it. That's amazing. I love that Did you know right away? (laughs) When you heard the high desert, you're like, oh, clearly elevation. I mean, I'm from here, so hard to say. Like, I I lived in Bend as a kid, so, I, you know. I love it. You're like, I'm from here, so I know facts about this area, <laughs> and I understand how things work. Okay, that's That cool. information was disseminated to me before I am even old enough to remember, but um, the the high desert is, is kind of a, like a funny way to describe it. 
Oregon's desert, especially going down into the into the southeast part of the state, is um, part of the Great Basin Desert, which is like a cold desert, right? Like, meaning that most of its precipitation comes in the form of snow rather than like rain. Gotcha. The area that we call the high desert is like uh, that landscape is called the sagebrush steppe which I think is really nice. That's pretty, yeah. Um, but nobody ever says that. So if you use that term, like maybe people won't know what you're talking about. But it's a cold desert. Too obscure. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately, what kind of stuff can you do in the high desert? Aside from like hike and take spiritual journeys, can I ride like a four-wheeler or anything fun and loud like that? Or is that going to ruin like everything for everyone? You can definitely ride a, a lot of four-wheelers on the eastern part of the state. Um, BLM land is cool because there's not a lot of rules, um, mm -hmm. really, at all. Uh, <laughs> when you're on Bureau of Land Management land, like it's kind of like all bets are off. You can camp wherever you want. Um, there's a ton of OHV areas, both in the, the central part of eastern Oregon as well as like on the eastern side. And it's honestly like, I mean, they're loud and annoying, but like I see the appeal. It's like actually like a great way to be able to see some of that landscape. There's also lots of rock hounding. You can go check out like ghost towns and abandoned buildings. You can, uh, yeah, go on some like really long, expansive walks and, and have a little journey to yourself. There's a lot of peak bagging you can do out there, like um, lots of mountains in the 8,000 foot range. Something that, that is fun in Eastern Oregon that I don't hear people talk about on the West side too, is like just, uh, hiking off trail and going to visit like springs and stuff, because mm -hmm. a spring in the desert is always going to have something kind of like different and interesting going on, whether there's, you know, just more animals nearby or like different types of plants and things like that. Mm, gotcha. It doesn't seem like a day trip because it's kind of far. Yeah. It, the closest area with that type of weather and terrain would be Maupin, which is like about a hundred miles away. So it's a day trip in the way that like going to Lincoln city is a day trip. Yeah. It's like a solid two hours away. It's you're mostly on the 84 the whole time. So it's like, um, it's pretty efficient drive. I also like going to Maupin because there's more than one way to get there. Like you can take the 84 and then go down through the Dalles and then you can go back um, over Mount Hood, which is a really beautiful drive. But Maupin is awesome because the Deschutes River flows through Maupin. It's the lower part of the Deschutes River leading to the Columbia River. It's the closest, best weather you can get in the spring and fall. Mm -hmm. um, if it's raining and terrible everywhere else, Maupin is your, your last shred of hope for a day or weekend <laughs> trip in the two-hour driving range. I spend a lot of time out there, even in the winter, because sometimes the weather is just a little bit warmer. That's not the high desert, right, though? That's like Maupin isn't considered that because it's too close in? Um, I feel like that's like it's like hard to answer that directly. It's like a mixed thing. The area around the Deschutes is very oh God, dry. Is the high desert in our hearts? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> There's no border where you're okay, like, okay, okay, now we're there. Um, the part of Maupin that I enjoy the most, which is a, a little BLM land called the Criterion Tract, where I lead hikes and stuff, is directly mm -hmm. across the river from the Warm Springs Reservation. So it's kind of cool because there's not a lot of access points if you're not on a boat. There's not a lot of pedestrian access to the Deschutes River, especially in the lower half. So that's one of my favorite ways to like kind of see this area that like not everybody gets to see. Yeah, that's really cool. And you just go, you go out there and you camp is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I camp or I like hike around off trail. There's also a bunch of glacial erratics out there, which are like giant boulders that were washed in on the Missoula floods thousands Ooh. of years ago. And so wow. if you know what they are, it's cool to find them because they're like huge chunks of granite. Like there's one the size of a washing machine on top of a little ridge out there. And uh, it's just cool to go visit it and, and take a look at it because you know how it got there. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, so Maupin. You know, I've never been, and it's the closest one. Here's the deal. I love the desert, but growing up in California, the desert to me is Palm Springs. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I said that, I was like, God, I can't believe. I'm just like, so date shakes in Palm Springs. Like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, so love, such a I love desert. that area, though. 
I love a date shake. I haven't had one since like 2009. <laughs> oh, I wish I could rewind time. Never mind. We didn't talk about palm trees. It's a desert. It is a desert, though. But that's what I'm saying is that's what I'm used to, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. I've actually been here this next one. You recommended Smith Rock, which I think is as, as a place for mountain climbers. Uh, but there are things for non-hikers to do, right? Like I've done a few things in Smith Rock that so wasn't my mountain climbing. I'll tell you about it later. I want to hear what you're suggesting people do in Smith Rock first. So th there's a lot of BLM area on the backside of Smith Rock. So, you know, obviously like the, the central part of the park is just is super breathtaking. Um, it's great hiking. I think there's some mountain biking you can do nearby as well. People take their horses down there. It's cool to just even see the people with horses. Yeah. Um, and then the rock climbing, obviously. There are a lot of like more kind of quieter, less trafficked parts of the park that are really peaceful and quiet. You can see lots of animals. They have nesting bald eagles there. Um, and it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful landscape to go hang out at. Oh, and you can swim in the river at the right time of year too, which is oh, nice. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. But the the area back behind Smith is called Gray's Butte. And there is more stuff for like mountain bikers, um, people doing like OHV type activities, People driving Jeeps up terrible, rocky roads. Really? Oh, my God. I just can't imagine taking a quad out there. It just seems like such pristine land. Like, Yeah, no, there's a lot of roads and uh, trail networks for, like, trails and different stuff on the backside of Gray's Butte. Mm -hmm. It's also a great place to camp if you want to, like, camp outside of the park and, like, hike in in the morning. And um, that's a really enjoyable activity, especially if you do it early before it gets hot. So this was a, a long time ago, but... I remember that my friend decided to make mushroom tea at Smith Rock while we were there. And then we went to go to the Painted Hills. And I was like on mushrooms on the Painted Hills. <laughs> and Solid choice. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't. Have you been to the Painted Hills? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, do you know how those the Painted Hills cows? They're like all they're like literally grazing they're like kind of on the hills because they're the painted hills cows. And I was like so high on mushrooms. I felt like, and I love steak and I know these cows. Like, I'm like, oh my God, I know you. And I felt like I was, it was like, I was like watching Brad Pitt act or something. Like I was like, you guys, <laughs> you guys, it's the cows. Like no one cared but me. <laughs> But I still think about that. I'm just like, oh my God, I saw the painted hill cows. It was so cool. I had no idea that there was cows. On, at the Painted Hills. Yeah, they graze. I mean, not again, not on the like, you know. Not on the thing. But it was really cool. Yeah. And I keep saying that and people are just like, we've never seen, just like you, we've never seen these cows. We don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, I didn't make this up. This is a real thing. <laughs> all right, that's all. There's a lot of cows out there. I know a guy who grew up out there who always says that the best examples of the Painted Hills type features are actually located on private land. Mm. Which is mind blowing to think about because what is there is really cool and it like yeah doesn't touch the stuff yeah. that people have on their own on their own thing. Yeah, well, there's like a cattle rancher out there. Yeah, I don't know. Make friends. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, let's take a quick break here, and when we come back, Norther has a couple more high desert destinations and some helpful tips on how to have a safer trip to them. Have you ever wished you could just go somewhere and decorate cakes? If you're nodding your head right now, well, Cake Hoopla has got you covered. A do-it-yourself cake and cupcake decorating studio in Tigard, they supply you with everything needed, including the baked cakes and cupcakes, and the frosting, the fondant, the sprinkles, tools, and even instructions if you're going for something a bit more highfalutin. You can join workshops, book private parties, or order kits to take home. No matter the skill level, Cake Hoopla has something for everyone. They even offer customizable packages for any kind of party. Kids' birthdays, company events, bridal showers, holiday parties, team building, Building, you get it. Customers can also book a table, the party room, the whole studio, or just choose a pickup option. For more info, head over to Cake Hoopla in Tiger just off I-5 or go to cakehoopla.com. Well, which one is the next one? You spoke about, is it Christmas Lake Valley? Christmas Lake Valley. Now tell me, I heard it's full of volcano stuff. I want to hear all about this. Yeah. Yeah, Christmas Lake Valley is really cool if you think that volcanic stuff is cool. 
Uh, there's a giant feature called Fort Rock. It was like a giant underwater explosion of lava. Mm. So it formed this like half of a bowl in the middle of cow fields in central Oregon. It's really cool. It's very photogenic and they have really nice uh, bathrooms there too. So 10 out of 10 <laughs> recommend if you've been driving all day or, or for multiple days, you, you want to know where the good bathrooms are. Just saying. Yeah. How far is this one? So this one's further away from Smith Rock, which is like already yeah. like, a, like what, three hours away or something like that? Smith is like a two, two and a half. Bend is like three-ish, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so Christmas Lake Valley is about four hours away. It's uh, just south of and east of like the Bend area. Mm -hmm. So you have Fort Rock and then you also have um, a bunch of different lava. They're called lava gardens out there. There are these like wow. little pods of jumbled lava with like little scraggly trees growing out of them and stuff. Um, probably the feature that most people know about is crack in the ground. Mm -hmm. It's like a cave without a top. Like it's, uh, it's very scenic. It's very photogenic. It's super fun to explore. I feel like that alone is worth going out there. But that being said, like there are many, many other things to see. So don't drive all the way to Christmas Lake just to go to crack in the ground and then turn around and go back because that's that's not a good use of your time. I remember John saying that our, our executive producer that he wanted to go see crack in the ground and he really sold it by saying it's just a crack in the ground. And I was like, cool, man, that sounds great. We should all go. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. But it's good. It's cool. It's it's really worth going to. Nice. If you don't like volcano stuff, um, they also have a shifting sand dune complex and a lost forest of ponderosa pines that exist in an area where they shouldn't be able to grow because they receive like a third of the water that ponderosa pines require in order to survive. So it's actually like a holdover forest from like um, the previous climate that was present in the desert. Because you know, the desert so used to cool. be underwater. It used to be like covered in Pleistocene era lakes. Um, there's also lots of fossils found out there. That's like where most of the fossils in Oregon come from is from Ooh. that region. From Christmas um, Lake Valley? Yeah. It's called the Lost Forest and Shifting Sand Dunes. And you Damn. definitely can drive your dune buggies and your OHV <gasps> vehicles all over the place. I've driven my Land Cruiser all over it. It's pretty fun. That is so cool. Oh, that sounds like something I'd like to do. Nice. Just like wheelie over, I don't know, dinosaur arm. That's exactly what's going to happen for me. <laughs> okay. Now the last one, I wish we had like a drum roll, <laughs> um, is Summer Lake area, which you say has some of the best views in all of Oregon, which is crazy. Never heard of it. Um, yeah. But Summer Lake, again, the desert, that's surprising. So how far is that one? That's a solid like four to five hour drive. You do get to stay on main highways, unlike when you go to Christmas Lake Valley where you have to like get on the dirt road and it takes forever. Summer Lake has a little privately owned hot springs. It's like my favorite paid hot springs in Oregon. Um, it's 20 bucks to go camp in their lot and they have like a bunch of really cute little cabins and stuff. And they have a nice like warm pool that you can swim in and then hot tubs in the back. Um, and they have really lovely bathrooms that are warm, which is, is <laughs> delightful. I'm serious. If you're out in the desert, you're going to be glad that you know these things. You need to know where okay. the bathrooms are and you need to know where the gas stations are. Everything else is up to you. Um, but if you've been out in the desert for like 10 days, like it's super important to keep your body clean when you are exploring desert landscapes because that like playa dust and dirt and stuff will just suck the life from your skin. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I've had the front of my shin split open while I was on a hike no, no, in no, the no, desert. No, no. No, yeah. No, 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 no. And all I had to put on it was sunscreen. So I had to take some like a gloopy ass mm -hmm. sunscreen and rub it into my open oh. wound. Oh. So oh. every day that you are in the desert, you wash your face, your hands and your feet and you put moisturizer on and then you put on your socks and you go to bed. D don't play around. Okay. So <laughs> the reason we love Summer Lake is because it splits us right open. Is that what I'm hearing? Like, why is it so great? Aside from everything you just told me right now. <laughs> It's great because there is a hot springs where you can keep okay. your body clean. There are cool mountains to climb. 
There's a mountain there called Diablo Peak that I climbed one time that is a very unique feature for the area. And there were wild horses on top of it when I got up there. So that was cool. They were just chilling on the summit block, like just chilling, eating sagebrush and stuff. Like the Painted Hills cows that I saw that were very real. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, that's so cool. (laughs) Um, There's also like a wildlife refuge area where you can do some birding. They have like little bird blinds that you can go in and look at birds. And even though I don't really know the names of very many birds, like you still enjoy looking at them. And it's a peaceful place to go if it's not during hunting season. There's swans everywhere, um, all kinds of cute little birds. And one time I saw a coyote puppy out there, which was maybe the cutest animal I've ever seen in my life. But the basin itself is really beautiful. It's this dried lake bed that's mostly dry all all year. And then um, huge cliffs that rise up from the side. So it's the whole basin is kind of like framed in by mountains and it's really pretty and scenic. All right. Well, I can't get the image of your shin split open. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> Before we wrap up, are you able to give us a few more tips? Like what else should we do so we don't die out there or come back with open sores? Yeah. Like I said, number one, take care of your face, your hands and your feet. Sunscreen is great, but you want to be covered. You want to like mm-hmm. cover your body um, because we are just not used to that intensity of, of UV light if we live um, on the west side. The most important rule of desert travel, though, is to always, always, always top your gas tank off, no matter what. There sometimes are 80 miles between gas stations in eastern Oregon, and wow. they often have very limited hours because it's practically a volunteer job. Um, to keep some of these places open. Mm -hmm. So always fill up your gas before you leave town. That is just a standard rule, no matter what you're doing in life. But then top off every time you can, especially in rural areas. It's never the wrong thing to do. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. I was going to be like, and water, right? You always want water, but maybe... You do always want water. I personally leave home with all the water that I need for my entire trip so that I don't have Mm. to rely on anything and really like anything else that you think you might need to like bring all the food, bring all the snacks, like bring all the stuff that you that you are really going to require and then don't rely on any uh, finding any types of services out there. Once you get past Bend, it's it's a very different world. Well, have you ever seen a mirage? I'm just curious. Is that a thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. They're really intense. I just got back from Nevada. And I, the thing that blew me away the most is that you would like see a car coming towards you and it would look like they were driving through water, including seeing the reflection of the car. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how is it reflecting the image of that vehicle like upside down when it's not even there? It's really strange. Whoa. No mushroom tea required. <laughs> Those cows were real, though. <laughs> well, thank you so much for breaking down some awesome areas for us to check out in, the, in eastern Oregon in the high desert. I'm really excited. This, this is a summer. Well, not the summer. This is the shoulder season, I should say, because I don't know. Going to the desert in the summer seems like a bad idea, to be honest. Yeah, I would agree with spring. that. Spring. Spring, fall. Yes, now. Spring, fall. Yeah. I want I really want to go out there this year and check it out. Maybe go look at this famous crack in the ground that everyone keeps talking about. It's worth the drive. <laughs> okay. 10 out of 10. Well, thank you so much, Norther, for hanging out with me. Yeah, thank you. It's always so fun. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend, rate or leave us a review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slims.